Yeah, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at, uh, you know, what prompted uh, the father to give up his son on the cross, what prompted Christ uh, to do the substitutionary suffering on behalf of us, to suffer on behalf of us. And oh, several passages in scripture reveal that it's because of God's love that he has for us uh, that prompted Christ's substitutionary suffering. And we read Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and uh, 15. And if you look at uh, these verses, it says, um, you know, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the last phrase says, Christ died for us. And uh, uh, if you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, you know, the, the, the first half of that verse says, he laid down his life for us. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 15, it says, you know, uh, that uh, Christ's love compels us uh, that, that if one died for all, so there is one who died for everyone, uh, then all died and he died for all, which means here he is talking about uh, Jesus Christ, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So here it's talking about if, and if one died for all, which means, you know, talking about Adam's sin, because Adam sinned, he died, which means all of us, you know, as human beings died, but it says here, and he, which means here the capital H is talking about uh, Jesus Christ, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose um, again. So uh, in these verses, uh, we have noted these statements, Christ died for us, he laid his life for us, um, uh, one died for all, he died for everyone, and here it's talking about, you know, that uh, this for us, for all, is again reminding us about the substitutionary suffering, the substitutionary death of Christ, uh, that, that uh, it reveals to us um, that Christ's suffering and his death was for us all. Uh, he did it basically for all of us, and he did it because of his um, love. So when Christ... Uh, died on the cross, you know, on our behalf, his love was demonstrated, uh, his love was defined for us, his love was displayed for us in what he did for us on the uh, cross. Okay, and uh, Rome, John chapter 15, verse 13, um, we read that, you know, greatest love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for us. Okay, so this is the greatest love. This is the holiest love. This is the highest form of love that God, you know, laid down his life for us. And this verse in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the, the latter half, verse 15 says that, you know, because Christ died for all of us, what should be our response? What does it say in verse 15? Yes, Christ did his part, you know, he died for us all, he uh, took our place, the divine exchange happened, so it's not something that we just celebrate, rejoice and be happy about, but what should be our response? Yes, thank you, Jacqueline, I have to live for Jesus. Look at was what were uh, Second Corinthians five verse fifteen says. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for the one who uh, died and rose again. Okay, so that should be uh, you know our response. Uh, you know, Christ set us an example uh, about to show us how he loved us, he show, he demonstrated his love for us, he displayed his love for us, he defined his love for us, and now, you know, it's our turn to demonstrate 
uh, and display our love for God. And how do we do it? Uh, we do it by no longer living for ourselves. What does it mean? We no longer live for ourselves means what? What does it mean when it says in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we no longer should live for ourselves? Not be doing what we would like to um, do. It means like um, we should not live. Uh... Just one minute, Rin. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, Nina says we shouldn't be doing what we want to do or we we will to do or choose to do. That's what you're saying, Nina? Yes, that's what I said. I mean, because uh, essentially, like when he said about uh, how we take up the cross, so it's talking about dying to self. I mean, there will be so many things that we would probably like to do, but we uh, set that aside and do what... Christ, I mean, we Christ control, not so much self control. Or even self control is fine, but a better thing would be what to be Christ control. Okay, thank you. Yes, doing what God wills for us, uh, doing what uh, you know, just being under His total submission and control, uh, not doing what we want to do or what pleases us. Thank you, Nina John. Yes, Rin, Rin Chami. Um, so uh, I'm, I was saying like, um, we shall live like how uh, we live, how the world um, wants us to, or how the world does it. And we have to live the way that he wants us to and um, live selflessly for him, for he gave selflessly for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Live selflessly for him because he... Uh, selflessly gave himself for us. Yes, uh, we no longer live for ourselves means, you know, we, like Christ, uh, he did the will of the Father uh, in total submission to what the Father wanted him to do, in total obedience to what the Father wanted to do. So we live like that. And we no longer live for ourselves means we no longer live to please our carnal nature, our sinful nature, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the world, the carnal uh, fleshly desires. We do not live to please anymore, but we uh, live to please the Father. Uh, Jackin says, crucifying the desires of our flesh on a continued basis, yes, uh, depending on the Holy Spirit with the help of the Holy Spirit. Very true. Very right. Thank you all for your um, uh, inputs and your answers. So this is what we need to do, not lo no longer living for ourselves, but living just like Christ lived. You know, he didn't live for sinful passion, sinful desires, uh, didn't live to please a carnal nature. Um, and that is why there was no sin found in him, even though he was a, 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 a human being in the fullest sense, fully man, uh, but he lived in total submission, uh, in total obedience, and doing the will of the Father, and not doing what pleases us, not doing our will, but doing his uh, will. Okay. Uh, another uh, thing that we can look at is the consequences uh, for our, uh, you know, our offenses, our, our, our sins, uh, you know, and what Christ did uh, to deliver us from those, these consequences for our sins and what we received uh, uh, in the bargain, what we received uh, as a result of, uh, you know, Christ taking upon himself our offenses. You know, when Christ took upon himself our offenses, Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says, you know, we are raised up. Uh, because uh, uh, we uh, and because Christ died for our offenses and he was raised up because of that we are justified so raised when we were justified is what we will look at um, at another as another work of the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross uh, can one of you please read Romans chapter 4 verse 25 please <coughs> Before that, Anand says, living to please him and glorify him. Yes, thank you, Anand. Yes, in all ways, living to just please God, but pleases his heart and to glorify him. Yes. Uh, can you go ahead and please read Romans 4.25? 4.25. 
who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Amen. Thank you, Rin. Uh, so here we see that, you know, uh, G, uh, our offenses uh, uh, was what caused Jesus to be delivered up on the cross. Okay, he was delivered up because of our offenses. That means he was crucified on the cross uh, because of our offenses. Now, the ancient Greek word translated delivered uh, means was it was basically used to, uh, for casting people into prison or delivering them to justice. So the ancient Greek word uh, for this word delivered you know, when we translate it, uh, it, it, it was basically used as uh, for casting people into prison or it was, it meant delivering them up to justice. So when somebody does something wrong, you deliver them, the sense you, you put them into prison because they are judged, they condemned for their wrongdoing, or you deliver them up to uh, justice. So here in this sentence, when it's uh, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Paul is saying, uh, Christ was delivered up for our offenses. Uh, here it basically speaks of um, the judicial act of God the Father. Now, God the Father is just, uh, He is righteous, uh, He is holy. And, you know, because He is righteous, He is just, and He's holy, you know, sin, when He sees sin, sin has to be. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 sin has to be judged, uh, sin has to be, justice has to be made for that sin that has been committed, uh, there is a punishment that goes out, and that is God's judicial act, because He is just, He is holy, He is uh, righteous, yes, sin has to be uh, punished. So, you know, as part of the judicial act of God the Father, you know, to punish sin or to punish the offenses of mankind, uh, uh, God the Father delivered the Son to justice that was required for the penalty uh, of the sins of the entire human race. So God the Father delivering the Son, God the Son, to justice uh, that required the payment of the penalty of human sin. And that is what it means, you know, delivered up. He was delivered up for our um, offenses, okay? And it's also interesting to read that, you know, uh, not only was Christ delivered up for our offenses and was raised because of our uh, justification. He was raised because of our um uh, justification. This implies that when our sins, when Christ paid for our sins in full, our sins was completely atoned for, you know, we were declared righteous in God's sight and Christ was raised. And when Christ was raised, his resurrection is a proof or an indication uh, that, you know, that we have been justified, that we are uh, you know, in God's sight, we are seen just as if we have never sinned. So what is the whole meaning of this phrase, raised because of our um, justification? What does it mean? Now, you know, basically the resurrection is uh, a very essential or it's a very important, it's a crucial place uh, in uh, our redemption because it demonstrates uh, what God the Father, you know, was perfectly satisfied with the Son's work on the cross. So when Christ was, you know, raised back from death to life, it basically demonstrates, his, his Christ's resurrection basically demonstrates that God the Father, you know, was perfectly satisfied with uh, the son's work on the cross or the atoning sacrifice of the son's work on the cross or Christ redeeming us from sin or Christ paying or making that full sufficient perfect sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And it proves that what Jesus did on the cross was, you know, a, a perfect sacrifice. Um, uh, 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 it was a perfect sacrifice which was made by the one who remained perfect even though he bore the sins of the world. 
Isn't that amazing? I'll repeat that again because this is this is so important. Actually, Christ's uh, resurrection, you know, has an essential or it, it has a crucial, important uh, place in our redemption, in us being redeemed from sin, death, and slavery, because uh, it demonstrates that God the Father, you know, was perfectly satisfied with uh, the sacrifice. Uh, the sinless Lamb of God, the substitutionary sacrifice uh, on the cross, uh, who was Christ made on behalf of us, that Christ's uh, uh, substitutionary suffering, substitutionary sacrifice was made perfect. Now we know that in the Old Testament, uh, that not one sacrifice was perfect. That's why there was, you know, sacrifices that had to be made day in and day out. You know, but when Jesus did uh, uh, sacrifice himself on the cross, or Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, you know, it was the perfect sacrifice which satisfied the penalty, the payment of sin that this righteous, holy, uh, just God required for the payment, for the penalty uh, for our uh, sins. And so Christ's resurrection basically proves that what Jesus did on the cross was in fact a perfect sacrifice which was made by one who remained perfect even though he took upon the sins of the world, even though he bore the sins of the world. Now we need to remember that you know, Jesus took upon himself the sins of the world, but even though he took upon him, himself the sins of the world, he remained uh, sinless. Uh, he remained uh, sinless, uh, he remained perfect, and, and because of that, you know, he was able to make the perfect sacrifice which satisfied uh, uh, God's, uh, this holy God, a God who's just, a God who is uh, righteous in every sense, every sense, and a God who requires uh, the righteous or the just payment for the penalty of the sins of the entire world. So we see that Jesus was delivered over to death because of our sins, and he was raised because of our uh, justification, which means our justification uh, is accomplished in the death of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is actually God's uh, so-called receipt, which you know he gives. Uh, and what is this receipt? The receipt is the Father's Amen, to Jesus, it is the work that is finished, it's the completed work, it's the full sufficient uh, completed work that satisfied uh, this Father, the heart of God, who is just, who is holy, and it's also heaven's acceptance of the death of uh, Christ. So, you know, if resurrection had not taken place, you know, um, if Jesus had not resurrected from the dead, uh, then there is no indication uh, or there would have been no indication that the death of Christ was, uh, you know, the atoning, the, the perfect atoning sacrifice. And there would be no indication that, you know, uh, that our sins were justified for or we were made righteous for. So it is because of Christ's resurrection, which is a big indicator that, you know, God the Father was fully satisfied and our sins were totally atoned for. We are totally made righteous and we have been made justified in God's uh, sight. Uh, so when Christ resurrected for the, from the dead, everything that Christ claimed uh, to be doing uh, by his death on the cross, you know, everything that he claimed to take on the sins, take on our curse, our sicknesses, our sorrows, our infirmities, our pain, uh, you know, breaking the power of sin, breaking the power of death, breaking uh, the power of uh, Satan, and we are no longer slaves of Satan, uh, including justifying a sinner who believes everything has been accomplished. So it was not just, uh, I mean, uh, death on the cross is very, very important, but also the whole thing of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, you know, uh, is uh, a powerful proof that, you know, the work is finished, uh, the Father's amen to what Jesus has done, and that 
uh, God the Father was fully uh, satisfied. Okay, so that is uh, the meaning of uh, Christ's death on the cross, what he did, and also what is the powerful significance of uh, the meaning of Christ's resurrection uh, from the dead. Everything has been accomplished, and that is why there needs to be no longer any sacrifice that has to be made. Yes, Anand Paul, thank you. It is uh, important for the gospel that we preach this, that we teach this, um, that Christ's resurrection is not just, you know, so that he can go back to heaven, he can receive back his glory, he can be uh, again with his father, go back to the place where he belongs, but what a powerful uh, you know, proof it is of what Christ has accomplished, what he has done. The whole thing was completed. The whole act of God, everything was complete and finished. And God was fully satisfied and happy. And that is why, you know, we had now made uh, fully righteous and fully justified in God's sight. Amen to that. Okay. And also we look at, um, you know, uh, what are the... Uh, you know, consequences that Christ endured for us, uh, even as he took our place, he made that substitutionary uh, sacrifice in our place. You know, uh, what uh, what did he take upon himself? What was the consequences that Christ uh, uh, endured? Um, and what were the results of Christ's substitutionary suffering uh, for us, what can be received as a consequence of what he did on our behalf. So he bore our sins in his body. Uh, uh, can one of you please read First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, please? First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Amen. So um, he bore our sins in his own body. That means Christ on the cross, you know, he bore uh, the misdeeds, he bore the sins, uh, he endured the consequences that we had to endure uh, because of our sin. Now, we are not going to list out all the consequences of our sin. You know all the consequences of our sin. But on the cross, you know, Jesus took upon uh, himself our sins, our misdeeds. He bore our consequences. Uh, um, he bore our, uh, bore our sins as a sin bearer. Uh, you know, he took uh, our sins. Now, we, we looked at, we studied this in the atoning sacrifice, which Israelites made, how uh, this, the, the lamb that was sacrificed, you know, took the sins of the entire Israelite race and that um, scapegoat, which was sent out into the wilderness, you know, bore the sins of the entire uh, Israelite uh, 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 race, okay, or the group of people. So when Jesus bore our sin, he became our sin bearer. He's uh, substituted in our place. And what is the result of that here? It says, you know, as a result of that, you know, um, um, we might be made righteous. We can be justified and uh, we might live for righteousness. And also uh, because of what he did on the cross, in our place, you know, we by his stripes, we are healed. So look at uh, the results of uh, Christ's substitutionary suffering on the cross. It says that, you know, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness. So here it's saying that you know, Christ bore our sins uh, in his body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness righteousness so basically peter is reminding us that when jesus died on the cross we actually also when we identify and we believe in him and we receive salvation we pray that salvation prayer we are also dead to sin so uh, and our life is permanently changed by our identification with jesus on the cross uh, even as paul describes this in romans chapter 6 so uh, you know, Paul talks in Romans chapter 6, he talks about our identification with Christ's uh, death, uh, with Christ's uh, burial, 
his resurrection, his ascension, and his seating. And that is what Peter is also uh, saying here, that, you know, that when Jesus died on the cross, we also died along with him. So what does it mean? It does not mean that we died, we paid the penalty for our sins, or we paid uh, the, we, uh, we uh, you know, uh, we died for our sins, we paid the penalty for our sins, but it was Christ who died for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins. We could not pay the penalty for our sins because we are sinful. But uh, what does it mean that we also died to sins? It means that, you know, when we identify with what Christ did on the cross, which means when we receive him as our Lord and Savior, it means that we, uh, you know, we go through this whole uh, identification process, which means we're no longer, uh, you know, uh, uh, the old man, we are a new creation. So what it means by uh, talking about a new creation, our life is permanently changed, which means uh, our life is per permanently changed. We are a new creation because of our identification with Jesus, not only on his the death on his cross, but also his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his seating. So how do we identify with Christ on his death? Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, when Paul says, you know, when Christ died, we died with him, which means the old sinful nature, the old man was crucified with him. That's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And he says, we no longer have an old sinful nature inside us, but now we are partakers of the divine nature, as we read in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, was uh, four, and the power of sin over our lives has been broken, and we are no longer slaves of sin, as Paul uh, again mentions in the same chapter, Romans chapter six, verse uh, fourteen. So that is how we identify with Christ's death. So don't misunderstand when Peter is writing it, saying that we die to sin. You know, it does not mean that you know on the cross we are also paying we are paying the penalty for our sins no it means that you know our old sinful nature is broken we no longer have the old sinful nature inside us now we are partakers of the divine nature the power of sin over our lives has been broken and we are no longer slaves of sin romans chapter 6 verse 14. now how do we identify with his burial uh, when christ was buried uh, we were also buried, which means we identify with him spiritually. Okay, it's not just physically, but spiritually we identify with him. How do we spiritually identify with him? It means that we are separated from the old life. And when somebody is dead, dead, and they're buried, they're separated from their old life. Okay, they're no longer living. The old life has gone. The new has come, uh, and now you know when when a person is dead, they have uh, you know they have. Uh, this glorious new bodies that they have and so the same way you know spiritually how do, how do we identify with this burial uh, the old has gone we're a new creation the old has no claim over our lives or any part in us second corinthians 5 17 so if you find yourself you know living in your past, living in the the old sinful nature of the past, we need to remind ourselves that we are a new creation and that the old has no more claim over us or any part in us and that we are a new creation and we need to conform ourselves to that new image in Christ Jesus. How do we identify with Christ's resurrection spiritually? You know, when Christ was resurrected, we also are raised up with him spiritually ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 it means that we are brought from death to life uh, the power of Satan. we have brought from out of the darkness of satan uh, the darkness of the kingdom of satan uh, we are uh, brought out from the power of satan unto god we read this in colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and now we walk in a new life uh, because we are children sons and daughters of god we are children of the kingdom of god we belong to the kingdom of god and so we have a new way of living and uh, because we have this new way of living the power of darkness has no longer hold over us so we need to know who what is our identification our spiritual identification and live along with that declare that and walk in that how do we identify with christ's ascension um, again, spiritually saying that, you know, when Christ ascended, we also ascended with him. How do we know that? 
We read this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. So can I ask uh, uh, Vimal, can you please read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 for us, please? And somebody else can please read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, Other. verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Okay, ma'am. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, thank you. He raises up a lot of heavenly places. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Can one of you read that, please? If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that, you know, when Christ ascended, we also ascended with him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. And what does Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 say, says that, you know, we therefore set our affections on things above. Okay, not on things that are earthly, but we set our affections on things above and we live uh, with a reward in mind where we see life from heaven's perspective and we see our life hidden with Christ in God. And lastly, we identify in, uh, you know, being seated at the right hand of God, the Father, even as Christ is seated at the right hand of God, uh, hand of God the Father, how do we identify spiritually? Because when Christ was seated on his throne at the right hand of the Father, you know, we were also made to sit together with him, uh, like we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, we are seated, which means, what does it mean? You know, seated at the right hand of God, it means a place of strength, uh, honor, and blessing. Uh, so, you know, uh, and it's also a place of authority. So we are seated in a place of authority, in a place of dominion in Christ Jesus, um, above all the powers of day, darkness, over all the demonic hosts, uh, and above Satan, because Satan is underneath our feet. Okay? So that is the whole uh, meaning of our spiritual identification. Yes, Vimal? Uh, Vimal, can you mute your mic if you don't have a question to ask? Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we see that, you know, uh, in, we read in Peter, uh, second P first Peter chapter 2, verse 24, where it says that we have uh, debt to sins. We are debt to sins in the sense that our, our debt, okay, not D-E-A-T-H, but our debt, D E. Uh, D-E-B-T of sin and guilt was paid by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So when we die to sin with Jesus on the cross, it means that he paid our debts. Uh, he took our place and we spiritually identify with, uh, uh, with dying with him on the cross when we receive him as our Lord and our Savior. So because Christ died for our sins, he paid for our debts we don't trouble ourselves with the debts that has already been paid for us because he bore our sin in his body on the tree. He took all our debt and paid them for us. And now each one of us can consider ourselves dead to those debts that we owe God. And those debts have no longer power over us. And hence we are dead to sin. Uh, because Christ suffered instead of us, in place of us, and we have nothing to do uh, with them anymore. And, um, and you know, they are just been, uh, you know, God looks at us as if we have never committed uh, those sins because those debts had been paid by uh, Jesus' life, by his sacrifice on the uh, cross. So the first... Um, a result of Christ, uh, or one of the results of Christ's substitutionary suffering that we see in First Peter chapter two, is that you know we are dead to sins, so that we can live for 
uh, righteousness. Now Christ made us righteous. Uh, uh, he has justified us. Christ looks, uh, God the Father looks at us as though we are right in his sight as people who are, uh, you know, who have not committed any sin, but it's important for us to live in that place, in that position uh, that Christ has uh, brought us to and not fall short of the glory of God as we have done in our, you know, when we lived in our old man, we are a new creation. Now we live, need to live with that new sense of identity and uh, you know, live to honor and please uh, God. The the second thing or the other result that we can see here as uh, as a result of Christ's substitutionary suffering, what we read in First Peter chapter 2, is by his stripes you were healed. So healing and wholeness in our total man, in our spirit, in our soul, in our body, is what Christ died for us. So we need to... Uh, Declare this, believe this, uh, receive this by faith, and walk in this by faith, and uh, you know, keep declaring it till we see total wholeness in our uh, in our spirit, in our soul, in our body. Amen. Any questions so far? <laughs> Any questions? Okay, there are no questions. We'll um, move on. Okay, um, we the other thing that you know Christ took our place was He became sin uh, for us. Second um, Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one. Uh, Chira, can you read that please? Second Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one. Yes, ma'am. Second Corinthians, Second chapter Corinthians 5, verse 5, 21. 21, yes. For he made him who knew to sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Thank you, Chira. So here we know that Christ was sinless, uh, but yet, you know, for our sakes, when he took our place on the cross, uh, he who knew no sin, uh, became sin for us. He was made to become sin for us and uh, so that we can become the righteousness of uh, God. Again, talking about divine exchange. So on the cross, Jesus took our sins, our guilt and shame uh, to deliver us and to make us who he created us to be uh, in his image and his um, uh, likeness. And Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, talks about uh, the essence of Christ's uh, substitutionary uh, suffering, which means talking about the real meaning or the core or the principle of Christ's uh, substitutionary uh, suffering is this, that you know Christ became sin for us. Christ who knew no sin became sin for us. Christ who knew uh, uh, you know, uh, no shame or guilt became uh, guilt and shame for us and also you know second corinthians 8 verse 9 says though he was uh, rich you know yet for our sakes he became uh, poor okay though he was rich in every way i'm not talking about worldly riches but riches in terms of being sinless being holy being righteous being pure uh, you know being uh, this great god you know yet for our sakes he became poor uh, which means he entered into our experience. Uh, he entered into our weaknesses and our frailties. Uh, he became uh, that for us. He became poor for us in terms of he entered into our frailties, our weaknesses, our sin, our guilt, our shame, our curses, so that we can become uh, rich. Another divine exchange that took place on the cross, Christ taking our place of being poor, uh, taking our place of being sinful, unrighteous, unholy, so that we can take his place of being uh, rich, of being righteous, of being holy and justified, um, and uh, being uh, made whole in God's uh, sight. 
again, oh, as we also looked at, you know, he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Uh, we read this in, uh, we read this in um, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 6. Uh, we also, you know, Matthew quotes this in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. So can one of you please read this, please? Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and uh, 17. Jackin, can you read that please for us? Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Or anyone else, Prabhu or Samuel or Shiv Kumar, anyone can read. Matthew 8, 16, uh, 16 and 17. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Amen. Thank you, Jackin. So here we see that, you know, we read already the beginning of our uh, class, this lesson, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 6, where it says, you know, um, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, uh, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, by his stripes we are healed, and here again Matthew is quoting this, but uh, you know, when Matthew is quoting Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4, uh, to what Christ did by healing um, the sick, you know, uh, all those who are demon possessed, he cast out with the, the spirits of the word, he healed all who were sick because the multitudes had come. Uh, it's just, just not talking about that on that day when Christ did this, that uh, when in the context of Matthew chapter 8, where Matthew is recording this narrative for us, that when evening had come, you know, all of them brought those who were demon possessed and were sick and Jesus just healed them. Uh, with his when he just spoke his word uh, it's not talking uh, it's not talking about the fulfillment of Isaiah prophecy then or only in that instance um, but you know um, uh, it does not mean that you know uh, that Isaiah 53 the prediction the prophecy that he made about Christ uh, would do was on that day when Jesus healed uh, and it's not just recorded for us here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, but also in other instances when Jesus, uh, you know, delivered those who are demon-possessed, when he healed the sick, uh, it's not referring to uh, the just the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy during the, the work of Jesus or during his time of ministry when he healed the sick people, but it's uh, the context of Isaiah 53, verse, verse 4, uh, to six where it talks about Jesus taking uh, diseases bearing our sicknesses uh, you know by his stripes we are healed is actually pointing out to what would be accomplished on the uh, cross and alongside with it is also uh, you know it's uh, uh, he also bore our uh, sins so it is you know talking basically about what he did on the cross and we can't just say because Matthew quoted uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 to 6 when he narrated this whole event of how Jesus uh, you know uh, delivered those who are demon possessed and healed the sick the prophecy was fulfilled in that instance only or during uh, you know the ministry of Jesus when he healed different people Isaiah chapter 53 was fulfilled no it was basically pointing out to the context of Isaiah 53 uh, is basically talking about, you know, when Jesus would die on the cross, he would take upon himself our diseases and be he, be he will bear our sicknesses. Um, and, uh, you know, that is the benefit of his substitutionary suffering and not just a few things uh, or the, the 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 healing miracles that he did one among them was uh, in what we see recorded for us in Matthew chapter 8 verse uh, 16 okay so what is the implication of the spirit of god quoting uh, you know Matthew chapter 53 verse 4 in connection with healing of the sick in Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 there are two important conclusions that we can uh, draw 
the first thing is that the ultimate purpose of Christ, you know, bearing our sicknesses and our pain in deliverance and healing of the sick and the oppressed was um, because he was going to all take it upon himself on the cross. Okay, so what Christ finished on the cross is what, uh, you know, we would experience in terms of us being healed and delivered uh, and made whole. So why did people experience it before? Because they were just receiving a foretaste of what Christ was going to accomplish uh, on the cross. So Christ bore our sicknesses and our pain so that we can experience his healing and wholeness in our uh, bodies. The second thing is that, you know, um, uh, what Christ did on the cross, which is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, that he on the cross, he took upon himself our sicknesses, our pain, our infirmities, is uh, basically talking about that how, you know, when we experience, uh, uh, you know, uh, deliverance from sickness, pain, healing and wholeness, you know, we can minister the same healing and deliverance to people who are sick, people who are oppressed, those who are possessed by uh, demons based on the finished work of the cross, based on the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross for us, because on the cross he bore all our sicknesses and disease, and we can minister this healing uh, to those who are sick. So please don't, um, you know, confuse yourself by saying that, you know, when Matthew quoted this in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, when Jesus healed all those who are sick and demon possessed, it's the fulfillment of the prophecy of uh, Isaiah. No, it is basically the uh, what Isaiah was talking about was the suffering servant and how he would suffer on the cross, you know, when he would take upon himself our sicknesses, our infirmities, our transgressions, uh, our iniquities, our chastisement, so that we can receive, uh, you know, a healing and wholeness in our uh, in our body, in our soul, and in our spirit. And this is the benefits of what we would receive as a result of Christ's substitutionary suffering on the cross. Okay, I hope you understood what I was trying to say. Yes. Okay. So Isaiah fifty three is basically pointing to the suffering lamb suffering of Jesus on the cross, but uh, he also quotes this in Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 because uh, it's giving a foretaste of what uh, Jesus would accomplish on the cross, what he would fulfill as a result of that, you know, what are the things that we can receive, we can receive healing and wholeness, and we can also, miss, uh, you know, uh, minister healing and deliverance to others as well. Okay. Another thing that uh, we can look at as a result of Christ substitutionally suffering on the cross is Jesus became a curse for us uh, so that we can receive the blessings of Abraham or we can receive the blessings of us being uh, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ or part of the kingdom of God. So can one of you please read Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, please? Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here uh, we studied about how Christ redeemed us from the law, from the curse of the law. We studied this in chapter 7. Uh, it has, there's two uh, implications uh, that we can see here in uh, what Christ did for us that we read about in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. And one of this we already discussed in chapter 7 uh, where it talks about Christ redeemed us from the law. Uh, so we, we understood that in depth, we studied that in depth, explained that. But there's another implication, the second implication uh, from what we can read here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 is Christ set us free from the curse of the law. We know that law brought blessings and it brought curses. Uh, 
uh, if you know if people disobey the law it brought curses if they obey the law it brought blessings and uh, this is listed out for us in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28 verses 15 to 68 Okay, all of the curses, all of the blessings is listed for us in this uh, chapter. So what are the curses? If you read that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you know, the curses are failure, poverty, oppression, sickness, disease, you know, torment in the mind and everything possible. So we see that, you know, when Christ died on the cross, you know, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, which means he redeemed us from everything that, uh, you know, God said would come as a curse as uh, if they disobey the law if they don't keep the law uh, which is oppression poverty sickness disease and everything failure as well you know so Christ has freed us from all of those things so it's good to go back read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 it's 15 to 68 and look at all of those things and now as a child of God, all of those curses are broken. So don't believe in that. Don't live in that. Don't declare in that. Don't, de don't declare that. Don't think that those are taking a control over your life. But just believe that because of the substitutionary suffering of Christ who took upon himself our curse uh, so that we can receive freedom uh, from every curse of the law, from every curse that sin brings, uh, we are set free and we can receive the blessings that God has for us and, um, you know, the blessings that uh, uh, as, as, are ours as, a, as part of the covenant, the new covenant, and also, you know, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, the blessings that uh, God said would be a result of the covenant that people keep uh, uh, as uh, the blessings that he gave to Abraham, okay? Uh, Nina John says, in all instances, Christ healed completely all who came to him. It's not quite that way now. How do we deal with this? Yes, it's not uh, uh, Christ. Yeah, when we see when Jesus healed everyone uh, who came, all were healed in, 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 in number of uh, passages um, in the scripture, in the gospels we read, and Christ healed them all. But we don't see that now. Um, when we don't see that now, we need to, you know, um, not uh, go back on our theology in saying that, you know, uh, 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 or we don't uh, doubt uh, the nature of God. We still hold on to this, the nature of God, that God is Jehovah Rapha. He is a covenant-keeping God. Uh, he is God who heals. He is a God who can heal every kind of sickness and disease. And we don't doubt that. We don't say, okay, it may not be God's will to heal this person, and that's why he did not heal. No, we don't, uh, we don't compromise on that understanding of the nature of God. God is healer. He is Jehovah Rapha. He will heal. He can heal. He will always heal. But there are times when he does not heal. Yes, when we read this even in 2 Timothy chapter 4, you know, uh, Paul is ending his letter to Timothy and he says, I have left Trophimus sick in, uh, in Miletus. Uh, so Paul here do, has done such great signs, miracles and wonders, such, such wonderful healing ministry. But he's saying, hey, I've left the man sick, which means he would have prayed for him. But yet, you know, he was, uh, uh, he couldn't uh, heal him or get him restored. So what do we do at such times? We don't compromise our understanding of the nature of God, who God is, but we go to him and say, God, you know, uh, what did I not do right? Or what should I have done that I did not do. Teach me, God, where I lack, what I should have done, uh, how sh I should press in. So we just press in uh, for more of God. We press in for what God is teaching us, showing us uh, what God wants us to do uh, and how he wants us to do. And we don't uh, think that God does not want to use us as well or he cannot heal in and through us or his power is not made evident in and through our lives or he does not want to heal that person, no. We don't think all of those things, but we always go back to God and say, God, what did I not do right? You know, what I should do next time that uh, that would bring about healing or wholeness. Teach me, God. Show me, God. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us and uh, show us. And we keep pressing it. We can keep praying for that same sickness for different people, but those people are not healed. Uh, but we still go back to our... Uh, 
uh, our intimacy, our, our, our closet with God and, you know, battle it out with him and ask him and ask us, ask him to teach us and show us and reveal to us what we need to do so that, you know, we can minister better and bring about healing. Okay, um, anyone else has any questions? No? Okay. Uh, we'll continue with the last point uh, next class. Uh, thank you all. You all have to submit your assessment today by end of day, so don't forget that. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good day and a good week ahead. God bless you, and I'll see you uh, next week. Thank you.